My walks take me to every corner of Britain as I seek out history embedded in the landscape. In this country, you're never very far from mysterious ruins or the shadow of unwelcome visitors. So from romantic moors to majestic peaks, I'm really enjoying some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me through a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This time I'm in Nottinghamshire, walking right through Sherwood Forest and up into the peaks of Derbyshire. I'm on the trail of an immensely unpopular king, a brutal medieval tyrant, sworn enemy of Robin Hood, and the man forced to accept the Magna Carta or lose his kingdom. Got it? Yes, I'm on the trail of bad King John. Today, the Peak District National Park is famed among walkers. 200 square miles of stunning Derbyshire parkland open to all. Over the border in Nottinghamshire, the peaks give way to the ancient oaks of Sherwood Forest, still famous for its folklore and legend. In the 13th century, these two very different landscapes were a playground for King John and would become his central stronghold as the kingdom turned against him. Over four days and 70 miles, my walk across this region will follow John's downfall. Starting at the medieval boundary to Nottinghamshire's forest, I'll discover how his quest for cash made powerful enemies as I reach Rufford Abbey. On day two, I enter the modern remnants of Sherwood and join the trail of Robin Hood. Then it's on to Derbyshire and up to Bolsover Castle before hopping over the M1 to reach my bed for the night. Day three, and I stop by Chatsworth to dig out some stonking evidence of John's approach to kingship. From there, the march to civil war leads me to Monsell Head. As John's kingdom unravels, my final push takes me to his fortress at the center of the peaks. And the momentous turning point in our history that was Magna Carta. So, who was John? He was a Plantagenet and born in 1167. As Henry II's fifth and youngest son, no one expected him to become king. But one by one, John's siblings died off, edging him closer to the throne. And in the year this Nottingham pub claims to have served its first pint, Henry II popped his clogs. Now, just two sons were left, Prince John and big brother Richard. Richard I, or Richard the Lionheart as we know him, has always had this glowing reputation, hasn't he? Fearless and brave when he was on the Crusades and noble and just when he was back home. So you've got him all heroic and John all nasty and villainous. But is that fair? Or is it just a cartoon version of history? I couldn't come to this part of the country without stopping by Nottingham Castle. The present building dates from the 17th century, but the site is still famous as the favoured hangout of John and his notorious henchman, the Sheriff of Nottingham. John was given the castle when he was still just a prince, together with the rich hunting counties of Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. Like most royals at the time, he'd spent his childhood in France. But this was part of England, where he could feel at home. The next 20 years would be seismic. John would get the throne and he'd be in charge not just of Nottinghamshire, but the whole of England. And a few years after that, he would become so mistrusted that the country would rise up and demand that never again should a king of England enjoy absolute rule? 
Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit gives you access to a growing range of documentaries presented by and featuring historians at the forefront of research and debate. Whether you are looking to find out more about charismatic leaders like Cleopatra or to discover the story behind the Industrial Revolution, History Hit will have something for you. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. To mark the Magna Carta's 800th anniversary, it's this story of John's fall from grace that I'm going to explore on my walk. I'm starting 25 miles north of Nottingham. I've had a tip-off that one of John's first dastardly acts as king took place at a castle just a few miles from here, and I want to find it. My route takes me through a landscape that looks nothing like our modern idea of a forest. But a forest this once was. Like the rest of the kingdom since the Norman invasion, royal forests were owned by the monarch. He then leased selected lands back to his most powerful subjects, the barons. This feudal system had worked for 130 years. But just 16 years after John got to the throne, the nation would be close to civil war. So what was it about John? I've arranged to meet medieval historian Graham Seal. I suppose the one thing we all know about King John is that he signed the Magna Carta, which I just happen to have a copy of. Very good. I was hoping you would. Back. Show me a good bit. Well, the one that everyone knows is, of course, Clause 39. Uh, oh, we which, all know that. Which, uh, <laughs> what does it say? Uh, which says, no freeman shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased, or that means have lands taken away, uh, without uh, judgment, legal judgment by his peers. And some people see it as proto-trial by jury. Yeah, yeah. But actually, the real clause in here is Clause 61, which is that the barons insist that if John misbehaves, they will destroy his castles, they will take his land, uh, he will become a phantom of a king. So the significance of this is that the barons are actually constraining him. More than that, they are collapsing his authority. John's misdeeds must have been extraordinary to prompt this first organised attack on the absolute power of a king. But was he really the monster history makes out? The chronicle source from later on in the 13th century famously says, as foul as hell is, it was made yet fouler still by the presence of King John. But you don't agree with the chroniclers, do you? You think that he was nicer than they do. Uh, I do, because there's an alternative body of evidence which suggests that he was. The administrative evidence, the record evidence, the charter evidence. What does that say about him? If you study that closely, that suggests that he was energetic, conscientious, vigorous, all of the things which the chronicles allege that he wasn't. It's hard to believe, Graham. It's, it's very... hard to believe. To judge for myself, I'm continuing my search for John's first castle conquest. And that means heading deeper into the old forest. 800 years ago, royal forests covered four-fifths of Nottinghamshire and around half of Derbyshire. But they weren't just for the king and his mates to hunt in. Anyone living or working within their boundaries was taxed under a punishing system of forest laws. The cash raised from these taxes was collected at the castle I'm trying to find somewhere near the little village of Laxton. That is Laxton Church there. Here's Laxton. There's the Mutton Bailey Castle. That's the route I reckon I've been going on. So, unless I'm daft, I think the Mutton Bailey should be... See where those horses are with those trees beyond? All right, it's over there. See if I can go around the side. Oh, 
Oh, that's classic, absolutely classic. Got to be a castle, look. There's the mop, there's the bailey. No, in my memory, I probably dug it sometime in the last 20 years and forgot all about it. 800 years ago, Laxton Castle dominated the landscape and acted as financial control centre for the whole of Sherwood Forest. I've asked local historian David Crook to share this lost castle secrets. So did this place actually belong to John? No, it didn't. It was the property of a lady called Maud de Coe. A woman, Maud? Yes, indeed. Was that usual in the medieval period? No, but she, she had recently lost her husband, and as a widow, without an heir, she fell to the king. She was in the king's gift, and John just took the, the man away from her. So now John gets direct administration of the forest? Yes, he does. John was always short of money, and the forest was one of the best sources of income in the later part of his reign. John nicked the castle off poor Maud just three years into his reign. He immediately handed it over to a lackey who ratcheted up the forest taxes. The king and his men were ruthless, but also highly organised. And helpfully for us, they wrote everything down. It's an amazing set of records. It shows where the king was on any particular day for most of his reign. Isn't that fairly unusual to have the day-to-day -day life of a medieval monarch in such detail? It's completely new. It starts in John's reign. So it's quite exciting for historians and archivists. Very exciting. And Where's our castle? Uh, our castle is there, Lexington, which yep. is the other name for Laxton. And on the 22nd of September in this year, he was at Lexington at the beginning of the day and was at Nottingham later. So he went all over the place, continued on the move. He didn't sit in the palace at Westminster. King John travelled relentlessly, averaging between 12 and 15 miles a day. And he was always on the lookout for new areas he could squeeze for cash. But why? In the early years, it wasn't just England John was ruling, but also roughly two thirds of modern France. He'd inherited this vast overseas empire from Richard I, along with a whole load of problems. Richard's crusades had left the kingdom broke. So right from the start, John's armies were underfunded and outmanned by the French. In 1204, disaster struck, and John lost control of Normandy, cutting him off from his remaining French lands. John has been beaten back here to England. His reputation and his kingdom are in tatters. From now on, there's going to be one goal, one obsession that will dominate the rest of his reign, to win back Normandy. But that means matching the military muscle of the French, and that is going to cost him money. Lots and lots of money. Following John's quest for cash leads me to Rufford Abbey. It's now a popular public park, but was originally built by Cistercian monks, whose great wealth, unsurprisingly, attracted the king's attention. Medieval historian Claire Taylor explains. It's a very mixed relationship. The beginning of the reign, John founded um, Bewley Abbey in Hampshire, which was very prestigious. Um, they were very pleased with that. But he'd done that really because they'd, um, they'd been upset about his forestry laws and they'd complained to him. But then, later on in the reign, he finds the, the, the order itself a huge amount of money. This abbey in particular had to, to find 300 marks. John fined this abbey around two and a half million pounds in today's money as penalty for refusing to support one of his military campaigns. After the loss of Normandy, no part of his kingdom was sacred. He didn't stop with the Cistercians. He went right to the top. He wasn't afraid to, to take on the Pope. Pope Innocent III was not a Pope that you messed with. Um, he, was, uh, he was one of the first Popes that decided that um, he was going to take on the secular world, the kings and the emperors. In 1205, Pope and King clashed. The Archbishop of Canterbury had just died, and Pope Innocent wanted to put loyal follower Stephen Langton onto this powerful seat. But John said he must go to his own yes-man, the Bishop of Norwich. They squabbled for three years before Innocent brought out the big guns and issued an interdict against the English church. An interdict is where the, all of the, the clergy in, in the land are forbidden from saying mass, 
It means that nobody can get married. We have stories about people being put into coffins, but they were hung from trees in church grounds. So it's people trying to find a way of um, burying their relatives, but the church won't let them do it. But then that didn't do any good, so he excommunicated John. He excommunicated him? Yes. John was banished from the church. Meanwhile, many of his subjects were so fearful of being damned to hell for eternity, they were forced to worship in secret. The churches were shut, the doors were barred, the bells stopped ringing, people were cut off from their religion at a time when religion was central to everything. And at the same time, John was failing diplomatically on an international scale, and everyone was groaning under the weight of all the taxes and fines. Dark days? I think so. Well, today's journey so far has given me plenty to think about, as I end it at the little town of Ollerton, on the fringes of modern Sherwood Forest. Today, I won't be able to see the wood for the trees as I head into what remains of Sherwood Forest, once the heart of King John's stronghold against the wild north. My route takes me right through the forest to John's pleasure palace at King's Clipston. Then it's over the border to Derbyshire and a linchpin castle at Bolsover. Finally, I hop over Chesterfield to end my day at the edge of the Chatsworth estate. Nice to see some trees. I've actually been inside the borders of medieval forest since I started this walk, but this is the first time it's felt like forest, or at least our modern idea of forest. Today, 450 acres is a public nature reserve, but Sherwood is a tiny fragment of what it was in John's day when he came here frequently to hunt stags and boar. As I've discovered, his royal forests were also earning him money. Hunting, farming, or even collecting firewood all required the king's permission, and it came at a price under forest law. After losing Normandy, John ramped up taxes across all his forests, and he squeezed Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire much harder than lands further south. I've joined a route John would certainly have traveled, the Great North Way was the medieval main road linking London to York. There was another medieval chap who came this way, or at least he made good use of other people who came this way. He had a green uniform, a pointy hat with a feather in it, catchy theme tune. I think you know who I'm talking about. It's impossible to come to Sherwood Forest without conjuring up images of Robin Hood. Uh, good stick. Back when picking up a stick could get you fined, it's not hard to see the appeal of an outlaw who championed the rights of the little people against a wicked king. But did Robin of Sherwood actually exist? Well, no. The legendary hero we think of today was shaped by centuries of popular ballads. 200 years after John died, the first ballad that we know of appeared, which specifically locates Robin here in Sherwood. It went, Robin Hood in Sherwood stood, hooded and hatted, hosed and shod, four and thirty arrows he bore in his hands. That's the bloke, isn't it? But in hundreds of medieval ballads, there's not one mention of King John. It was actually 19th century novelist Walter Scott who made John into Robin's villainous foe. Hollywood lapped up Scott's version and has regurgitated it ever since. So the mythical Robin only sealed John's dastardly image in the last century. There's another chap who didn't help either. John's tax collector, the Sheriff of Nottingham. Some of you may remember a children's show I wrote in which he stalks this very forest. Maria, Maria. Now in the middle of a forest ridden with unseen dangers, anything could jump out on us. 
Mad axemen, werewolves, lunatics. You money all your life. Idiots in skirts and berets. You think I'm frightened of you? The sheriff of Nottingham is frightened of nobody. Morning. Ah! It's Robin Hood, the fiercest bandit in England. Well, come on, I had to keep the best part for myself, didn't I? But what I find really interesting is that the Sheriff of Nottingham did actually exist. Although from the year 1208 until after King John died, the Sheriff of Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, as he was known, would actually have spoken more like this because he was a Frenchman, if you didn't understand what that accent was. His name was Philip Mark, he was a henchman of John's, and this forest would have been part of his patch. For proof, here he is in the Magna Carta, named and shamed. Paragraph 50, we will entirely remove from their bailiwicks the relations of Gerald Athey, Engelard of Sijoin, blah, 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 and Philip Mark with his brothers and his nephew Geoffrey and the whole brood of the same. In other words, by the year 1215, Philip Mark was so unpopular that the Magna Carta specifically states that he and his family should be booted off their land. There aren't many names singled out in the Magna Carta. The sheriff obviously made some powerful enemies. Morning, Tony. Morning. Morning, Tony. All right. I'm all right. 800 years ago, Sherwood would have been much more open to allow for hunting and farming. But some of these trees would already have taken root. Today, a small team of foresters care for almost a thousand ancient oaks. The trees are known as veterans. Cool. That's a gorgeous old tree, it is, isn't it? So we're just in the process of banding it. We're trying to get it to move as one tree again. It's a bit thin on top, isn't it? Yeah, that's what happens with veterans. The first thing they do is they spend the first 300 years to grow, and then they spend 300 years to live their life, and then they spend the last 300 years gracefully dying. So this is retirement? So in this case, it's retiring, yes. Yeah. You're not going to do this to all your veteran oaks, are you? No, it would be costly, but also we, you don't want to go around a forest full of metalwork. So no, we only do it to the most vulnerable ones, yeah. but in, we still look after them all. That's fantastic. So you've got a, a thousand old trees and each one has got its own care plan. Yes, yes, that's correct. Sherwood's poster boy is the major oak. With support from generations of foresters, it's holding up pretty well considering it's at least eight centuries old. It's amazing to think that when King John was hunting here, this would have been a little oak just tentatively stretching out its roots. Time to leave modern-day Sherwood, but I'm still well inside John's medieval forest. Three miles south of the major oak lies the village of King's Clipston, and a window into the King's private life. Compared to many medieval monarchs, John was almost straight-laced. We only know of seven illegitimate offspring, and all of them were born before John got hitched to French heiress Isabella. By most accounts, she and John got on quite well. Who knows, maybe he had a softer side. John may well have brought Isabella to his palace at King's Clipston. Deep inside old Sherwood, this was one of his most private and most lavish retreats. We have lists from the historic documents of chapels, accommodation, um, chambers, great halls. We're probably walking through what was the garden area. That's our current belief. But why did he bother to invest in this place when he got a whole castle at Laxton just down the road? Ah, well, Laxton Castle was for the dull administration and paperwork and stamping. This is a different thing altogether. This is a royal pleasure gardens, a royal retreat house that could be used for hunting, entertaining dignitaries and romancing. I love the fact that we're looking at three walls of a place that John built to have a good time. <laughs> so John knew how to party. In contrast to the popular image of him as a frail Weasley man, he had a healthy appetite and in middle age, a waistline to match. 
But this place saw bad times as well as good. In 1212, a royal hunting holiday ended in disaster. To explain, Andy's taking me to the old entrance to the palace, 30 minutes walk to the northwest. I brought you here because I want to show you this tree. This is a very famous tree in Sherwood Forest, and it's known as the Parliament Oak. Why? Well, in 1212, we believe John was hunting through Sherwood Forest when he heard news of a rebellion in Wales, and he summoned barons here under this tree to hold Parliament. We can't be certain John held a Parliament at this exact spot, but he certainly was in this region when he learned of the Welsh uprising. And that was a significant moment in his reign? Yes, we think it was a pivotal moment in his reign. From the point of that rebellion, things start to go downhill for King John. John had angered some Welsh lords when he seized their lands and took their heirs hostage. He crushed the rebellion quickly, but even by the standards of the day, his next move was brutal. John ordered 28 of the Welsh hostages to be hanged from the walls of Nottingham Castle. Some were as young as 12. I'd been wondering whether the Robin Hood legend had helped to give John an unfair reputation. But here he is in the year 1212, facing a real rebellion after years of simmering resentment. And what's his solution? He kills a bunch of kids. I'm finally leaving medieval Sherwood as I cross over the border into Derbyshire and up to the mighty castle at Bolsover. This hill site was fortified even before the Normans, although the semi-ruined and rather romantic pile here today dates from the 17th century. After hanging the hostages, John faced mounting discontent, and not just from the Welsh. Powerful barons north of here had always been a law unto themselves, and now some of them were becoming openly hostile to the king. Once there'd been an actual uprising against him in Wales, John realised that there was the possibility that something similar might occur elsewhere in his kingdom. But he calculated that if it came to a direct confrontation with the rebellious barons in the north, this was one of the key places where he'd be able to hold the line. John shored up his defences at a total of 10 of his castles, including this one. He was bracing for trouble from north and west. To follow the march to Magna Carta, I need to head closer to enemy territory. But someone's gone and put the M1 in my way. So I'm leapfrogging over it. Tomorrow, I'll pick up King John's trail in the fabled walking country of the Peak District. Day three, and I'm walking right across King John's front line against an increasingly rebellious north. When I left Bolsover Castle yesterday afternoon, I discovered that King John had been spooked into shoring up his defences all over this region. And by the year 1212, in small parts of the country at least, this rumbling discontent had escalated into violent uprising. My route takes me over the moors to Chatsworth and some first-hand evidence from John's reign. Then I join the stunning Monsell Trail as I head into the heart of the Peak District National Park. After almost two days spent crossing the medieval forest of Nottinghamshire, in just a few miles, I'll reach another. The forest of the peak covered around 200 square miles. It rivaled Sherwood in size and in the amount of tax John could squeeze from it. He inherited his forest laws from the Normans, whose feudal system was all about controlling the population. But more than any monarch before, cash-strapped John turned his kingdom into a business. 
While I was reading up in preparation for this walk, something really rather exciting cropped up. It seems that Chatsworth are in possession of some original archive material, in other words, primary sources, that go back right to the time of King John and give us a really vivid picture of what was going on round here. My route from the east brings me the walker's back way to the great house. In John's reign, records show a medieval hamlet here, also called Chatsworth, and perched on the fringes of his Forest of the Peak. It was more than 500 years before the Dukes of Devonshire began taming the valley into the world-famous parkland, gardens and spectacular water features we know today. But what I've come to see isn't on the guided tour. I've arranged for Magna Carta expert Dr Sophie Ambler to yeah. join me down in the bowels of the building. Oh, there's two of them. There's two of them. Yeah. These beautiful charters were legal documents issued okay. by John himself when he held court near here over 800 years ago. The first thing that strikes me about these is that they're incredibly good nick. Mm. We begin here with King John's title. Now, this is it's quite a long title, as titles go. John, by the grace of God, King of England, Lord of Ireland, Count of Anjou, know that we have granted, and in this charter confirmed, to William Fitzwalkerlin and his heirs, that the manor of Stainsby may be free of forest law. So is it actually like a deal between the king and a particular subject, that the subject pays money and King John gives him something in return? Yes, William Fitzwalkerlin offered 60 marks for the confirmation of three charters. That's about, that's 40 pounds, um, which to somebody like William Fitzwalkerlin was quite a lot of money. What does he get out of this deal? What that means is that William is free to cultivate his lands and develop his estates as he sees fit. So under forest law, you couldn't cut down trees, you couldn't hunt, you couldn't fish without getting permission from the king. This is deregulation, isn't it? This is a businessman suddenly being unshackled and being able to make money out of the forest. Yes, it's life-changing, it's an investment because this is not just a grant for him, but also for his heirs. And from John's point of view, it's good business. It's very good business for King John. He confirmed hundreds and hundreds of charters. All of those tidy little sums add up to quite a lot, and that's a lot of money in the coffers. By deregulating chunks of his forests in return for cash, John was selling off the family silver. In just 12 years, he quadrupled the total royal revenue to £83,000 a year, which is over £100 million in today's money. No mean feat, even for a mean king. Just west of Chatsworth, the old town of Bakewell sits on the boundary of John's great Derbyshire money spinner, the Forest of the Peak. Like the rest of the region, Bakewell's got John's sticky fingerprints all over it. In one deal, he even handed over the ancient town church of all saints to an ambitious bishop. Hunting forests, castles, churches, everything had a price. Heading west out of Bakewell, the Monsell Trail runs along eight and a half miles of the old Midland Railway. In the last 20 years, it's become a main walking route into the heart of the Peak District National Park. On my walk, it's been easy to see how John made enemies. After the loss of Normandy, he was ruthless in his taxes, and he could certainly be cruel. But he was a medieval king. Tyranny is in the job description. So just what tipped England from simmering resentment into rising up and producing the Magna Carta? I'm hoping medieval historian Lauren Johnson can help me join the dots. I think the trouble with John's reign is you have a situation that's been bubbling away for a really long time. This sense of the king interfering in people's lives, the yeah. fact, particularly the barons' lives. The but all sense... kings were doing that, weren't they? Yeah, you're absolutely right, but the difference with the previous kings is that they have this continental 
set of lands that they can pop over to and use to source funds from and spend time in. Whereas John, after the loss of Normandy, is in England all the time. So he's constantly on their doorstep pressing them for money. What about the hanging of the Welsh hostages? That kind of helped. No, I don't think it did. The trouble is that uh, just as the Welsh Rebellion is really getting going, you have this situation where King John finally discovers a plot that might have been going on for a while. The barons not only want to actually move him aside and take power for themselves, they actually want to have him killed. So three years before Magna Carta was on the table, there was a plot to murder the king. The ringleaders were powerful northern barons who hadn't forgiven him for the loss of their own French estates when he had lost Normandy. Not to mention all the taxes. So John's in the right old pickle. Is there any way out for him? Well, one option, of course, is to go and actually try and crush the uh, men in the north, yeah. but that is a, a real dangerous situation for him to be getting into. Yeah. The much more obvious solution, what he has been building towards for the past 10 years, is to go back and try and retake Normandy. Which also sounds pretty dangerous. It is pretty dangerous, but at least it's dangerous outside his own kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> and he demands soldiers from the people of England, all of the barons, and again, the Northmen say, no, we are not sending you soldiers, we're not sending you money, we're not going to help, this isn't our fight. So he goes to Normandy, unfortunately somewhat undermanned. He has some successes during his time there, but when it gets to the Battle of Bouvines, where the King of France absolutely trounces all of the opposition. That's the most decisive battle, probably, of the entire Middle Ages. It's after the Battle of Bouvines. It's not a case, really, of whether there's going to be an English rebellion. It's just a case of when it's going to happen. John's catastrophic trouncing by Philip of France at Bouvines was the last straw for his seething barons. It's a bit of an emperor's new clothes moment, really, isn't it? John's been squeezing money out of everybody left, right and centre on the promise that one day he'll get Normandy back. But when the moment comes, he can't deliver. And with France off the agenda, he's now got a new problem. He could lose this country as well. Final day of my walk, and it's the big one, as I follow the slide to civil war that produced the most famous document in English history, the Magna Carta. From Monsell Head, I follow the Limestone Way northwest through John's Old Forest of the Peak to reach Peveril Castle. Then, on a final push towards Kinder Scout, I'll look for the legacy his reign has left us today. Following John's defeat in France in 1214, war with the barons looked inevitable. Drastic action was needed. John went cap in hand to the Pope, ending his five-year excommunication and securing a powerful ally. Unfortunately, it was too little, too late. But when violence erupted, it wasn't in the North or even Wales, it was in London. In a shock move, on the 17th of May 1215, rebel barons seized the tower, pulling the might of John's capital city from under him. His kingdom was shrinking fast. Where can John feel safe? Well, up there, for a start. It was said anyone who held Peveril Castle and its sister fortress at Bolsover held the whole region. Peveril was built in 1176 by John's dad, Henry II. Its perch, high on a limestone ridge, turns almost sheer ravines to incredible defensive advantage. I wouldn't want to be the one attacking this place in the days before cannon. Imagine trying to lug a siege engine up here, or even just walk up in a suit of armour. Oh, you'd have a coronary by the time you got to here. John had loyal retainers installed right through his Midland stronghold, all the way from Laxton to this castle. But even if his men could hold this central core of the country, it wouldn't be enough to save his throne. 
John had already lost too much support elsewhere. The only thing for it was to meet the barons and negotiate terms. In June 1215, John travelled to Runnymede in Surrey. John just pushed it too far. He demanded too many taxes, and by 1215, the lid blew off. I've asked medieval historian Richard Eales to help me make sense of this momentous turning point in English history. He'd lost control of just too much of the ruling class. They'd realised that royal power was so strong that they had to band together. They had to go to the centre of government, to, to where John was, and force him to accept concessions at the national scale. So that's what gives us Magna Carta. On the 15th of June, John put his seal to a charter limiting his own royal power. 800 years later, Magna Carta has been woven into our nation's DNA. But on the field at Runnymede, it was a peace treaty, hurriedly thrown together by deputations from both sides. It's got some things in it which look to us like great statements of principle. No free man should be imprisoned or ruined without trial by his peers. And, and that's great stuff. But then there's also another lot of clauses that are really just about immediate tactics in 1215, that we're going to chuck out of the country a number of particular you know, friends of John that we don't like. All foreign soldiers and crossbowmen have to be thrown out. So it's a ragbag document. Did John ever have any intention of sticking to it? Probably not. I mean, the historical evidence won't tell us what's going on in people's minds, but we do know that pretty quickly he started asking the Pope to release him from his promise, his oath, to keep to the terms of the Charter. It was meant to produce peace, but actually it produced a slide to civil war. The extremists on both sides took over. It's not just John. On the Baron's side, on the rebel side, there are quite a lot of people who really hate John, and they don't really want to make a deal with him. They want to depose him or kill him. What we're getting, as with so many civil wars and disputes you know, going on now, is, is a slide to extremism. So in 1215, Magna Carta failed as a peace treaty and was thrown aside. Now, the Barons' War began. John furiously rallied his supporters, but even this region was no longer safe. Mighty Bolsover Castle came under siege, not from the rebels, but from the king's own allies, who were now squabbling over the spoils of his crumbling authority. Down in London, the barons threw open the gates to Prince Louis of France, giving the rebel factions a figurehead to rally behind. The final leg of my walk towards Kinder Scout is also the most dramatic. The great ridge of Rushup Edge gives walkers what must be some of the best views in the country. In the months after Runnymede, John was far from defeated. He powered around the country, stamping on insurrection. But then 1216 brought disaster. If one famous account is to be believed, the king was travelling to Norfolk when he started feeling ill. Oh, sorry, guys. He turned around but sent his baggage train onto the causeway to cross the great estuary of the Wash. Trouble was, they'd not checked their tied timetable. Carriages sunk into the mud and the tide swept the convoy away. In that accident, he lost something really ominous, his crown jewels, which had been in one of the carriages. And he never recovered from his illness. On the 19th of October in the year 1216, in the middle of the Civil War, he died in Newark, back in Nottinghamshire, on the outskirts of Sherwood. He was suffering from dysentery, and rumour had it that he'd gorged on a surfeit of peaches. And knowing the royal appetite, it could have been true. As I pass through the beautiful Edale Valley, I've followed John's rise and fall across almost 70 miles and 17 long years. There's a lot of really obviously bad stuff, isn't there? He's ruthless and cruel and does a lot of things which today we would consider barbaric. But this is the 13th century, for goodness sake. If you're a feudal king, that kind of behaviour goes with the territory. John was a failure as a king, but he wasn't some kind of cartoon villain. 
Magna Carta railed against absolute power, but that problem had been around since 1066. John's blundering just made it a whole lot worse. The Great Charter only became ingrained in our history thanks to compromises made after John's death. The advisers to his heir, his nine-year-old son Henry, negotiated peace, and a new and improved version of the Charter was issued. The Baron's War melted away. Over the centuries, Magna Carta has been cited as the cornerstone of everything from land rights to trial by jury. What started in the year 1215, bit by bit, has become our modern democracy. And now our common rights stretch to all corners of our lives, including walking, of course. I'm finishing my journey with a modern story that invokes the spirit of Magna Carta and took place here at the centre of John's Forest of the Peak. Joining me is journalist and fellow walker, Rowley Smith. This is Kinder Scout up ahead of us, and this is where, in 1932, the famous mass trespass took place. It was a move by a group of young Manchester walkers uh, to overcome the fact that they could see these fantastic moors from their homes, from their factories, but they couldn't walk on them and they decided that if there was enough of them, they could do something about this. So they organised this mass trespass, and as a result of which, six were arrested merely for walking on the moors. Thanks to the trespassers' defiance of private landowners here on Kinder Scout, all this land is now open to walkers. <laughs> In fact, their action kick-started the Right to Rome movement across the whole country. Oh, that's quite a climb. Yeah, but it was worth it, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, what a view. It's a privilege to be up here, really. So is the fight won? No. Scotland has got de facto access to all of its countryside. We want the Scottish model here. So, as far as I'm concerned, the fight goes on. So what started back in the 13th century with a struggle against oppressive forest laws and ended with Magna Carta, actually, is still going on into the 21st century. Absolutely right. I think we should set a good example, don't you? I Stop think we hanging should. around and get on. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs>